Am I like crooked? Kick this. And... Well, it looks pretty good to me. All okay, right. Worse. Welcome, everyone. This is Pittsburgh Pat, and I'm here with Ryan Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were waiting for me. I was waiting for you. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, I'm Ryan but, Doyle. Yeah, that's okay. a terrible. Like, you know, I should be like, and with and do something like, you know, Craig Ferguson. This is clearly a, a rehearsed conversation that we've we yeah. very carefully curated to make it like seem like it's an impromptu. Um, it's but this seamless. is all this is all scripted, folks. Our impromptu is seamless. So so what we're gonna <laughs> talk about today, or what one of the things, because you know, our conversations always go, but um is uh uh, Dolman Wood, uh, and mm. my first impressions, um, and I don't know what kind of experience, how much experience you have with Dolman Wood. How much experience do you have? Uh, well, it's been, it's my new favorite thing. So I've been reading a ton of it. Yesterday was the first time that I ran it, but gotcha. I've been prepping it for a couple of weeks and I've been like flirting with prepping it for a couple of weeks before that. So I've just discovered this through you uh, sending me uh, some texts and emails and that sort of thing. And uh, also being a player at the table. So I'm a PC at Ryan's DMing. And we have just to fill it out, we have two other uh, player characters at the table. Um, well, two other players at the table. There are apparently going to be multiple characters. That's something that's interesting, right? So we're going to mm -hmm. have like, um, not servants necessarily, but like uh, um, like a squire if you're a knight or like a, you know, a Sherpa if you're like going on an expedition, somebody like take care of the animals and take care of the provisions and that sort of thing. This is a very realistic like campaign, isn't it? Yeah, I like it a lot. So it is, um, it's an adaptation um, of old school essentials, which is, I don't know, you can argue about all of these things for days and days and days, but it is a, a very well regarded, if not the best regarded uh, formatting of the basic expert old school D&D um and the, the the gentleman who made that gavin norman has been working on dolmanwood for 10 years it's essentially his like home campaign uh, um and yeah so you have uh retainers is the the term of art or like That's what i was looking for retainers. Uh, because because life is cheap in old school dnd uh our buddy rolled up a magic user right a wizard um and he has two hit points <laughs> and he yeah. was alarmed by that because we're all, for the most part, coming from a fifth edition lens. I don't know how much experience you have had with like old school D&D, but I've, the majority of my D&D career has been fifth edition. Right. So Pathfinder. Um, and, you know, I, da I dabble in other things here and there, but like the, the heart of it has been fifth edition. So transitioning to a, a different style of play that's still like D&D down in its bones like the the godfather of dungeons and dragons has it's, it's been very interesting um and it's been a transition i mean it's i think we, we had a lot of fun last night but i think it, there were some there were some bumps in the road for my side of the screen oh really see i did not see that you you have so far been a seamless dm i i have mm -hmm. to um admit that i was um uh seriously impressed uh by your dming skill and then um, last night I started to, I fell asleep to a bunch of YouTube videos talking about um, this universe, Dolmenwood. And, and mm. again, as you mentioned, uh, 10 years in the making, um, lots of great artwork, but the richness of the story. And I think that's not to take anything away from, from what you did, but like there's a, a great amount of, of, backstory here like so so were you reading a lot of that stuff or you had already read it and were recalling it or um like you well, were doing descriptions so of characters like you were talking about the guy who owned the the um the tavern who um had the uh the bath water and he was mm -hmm. stoking the fires mm -hmm. and he had his belly followed um led him around because yes you know, that's a wonderful turn of phrase that i've heard used before and it's polite and uh and the, you know, that kind of description of like him missing teeth and having a crooked nose. So in, those in were the all book, things in mm -hmm. the book. So there, there is so flavorful and so punchy or like, don't, don't do too much research. Right. Cause spoilers, but right. Um, I want to explore. I want to, I want to experience he's a very, it. he's a very talented TTRPG writer from behind, from my side of the screen. It is there's so much there and so compact 
of a package, right? It's like I it's what I strive for, but I get very worried. But he's just like there was like four descriptors with commas. Like, here's what this guy is. And I just deliver them in a more verbose way because that's how I get talkative. Um, but yeah, just a couple, like I know that guy. I worked with that guy for four years. The guy who's like his belly enters the room, you know, a yes. couple seconds before the rest of them does. Like, I know that guy. Yeah. Uh, no, I, and it's the thing, it, but that's the interesting thing is so uh, the play, and this is true for all writing. Uh, I was, you know, uh, one of my degrees is in writing creative writing. So like one of the things I play with, with characters. And I also, for those who already know my channel, but they may not know me if we're on your channel and they're watching this, uh, I do adventure league DMing. And I also teach DM, uh, I teach Dungeons and Dragons to kids, um, mm -hmm. for after school programs and that sort of thing. So, um, and get paid for it, which is ridiculous, but, uh, I love it. And I know, right. This is no, everybody come out there and do this. Like, this is a great way to teach kids finance and cooperative strategy and tactics and, uh, things that are going to serve them well, you know, like, um, resource management, how to get along with each other, you know, and work mm. towards a common goal. Like there's a lot of great stuff, but, but yes, the difference between, this and 5e there are so many different things but one of the things you mentioned was uh descriptors and uh there's an interplay between like using um an archetype mm. you know but not turning it into a stereotype so you want to mm -hmm. like have that abbreviation for the archetype but you want to mm -hmm. have like a distinctiveness about it that makes that character special right so and like this, this nails that so well. That's why I I I, I fell in love with it. We we're whatever. We're in a transitional phase at one of my at the the table. You join people coming and going. We're switching systems around. We're thinking about what to do next. And this just like bit me and would not let go because it's so good. It's also my like preferred vibe. I love a good fantasy like dark forest setting where the the fae are just around every corner and they're not just like. Uh, you know, a more attractive person that happens to have pointy ears. It's like, no, they're going to make some weird bargain and they operate by their own rules and is like just uh, whimsical, but dark at the so same I, time. Yeah, I like, so obviously this is a medieval, right? So we're we're in the classic D&D &D medieval mm -hmm. setting, right? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. also there were some interesting descriptors in the, the brief uh, thing, which compared it to other uh, intellectual properties. Uh, one that mm. I thought was really fascinating was Legend, the movie Legend mm. from 1984, 1985. I can't remember the exact year. Um, and uh, that was, you know, Tom Cruise and Mia Sarah and the uh, most, uh, my favorite devil portrayal on screen, you know, by Tim Curry as darkness. And, um, and just, but that, but the, but the way the Fae in that are, Fickle, you know, and and mm -hmm. jealous, and uh, have, like you said, have their own agenda. Whereas, you know, it's like the original Tinker Bell, not the cleaned up Tinker Bell, but the Tinker Bell who's like kind of nasty to people and like is jealous of Peter Pan and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, it's not like the 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 little ones, you know, the little fairy gardens with the happy gnomes and that sort of thing. Like everybody's got their own thing, and it feels alive. And I think that's what's interesting mm -hmm. about it. You know, it's. There's a history table. Yeah. And that's what I that's what I strive in my in the tables that I have on the DMs guild and like my homebrew setting. I try to make it I try to breathe as much life and interconnectivity as possible to make it feel like it's not just a trope. It's not just like the disnified two-dimensional fantasy wonderland. It's like, oh, you you can walk up to anybody and have a conversation and they and you will maybe learn things. Um and it's interesting. I think that was the the bump that I was alluding to before, because it's very it's a hex crawl. Quite literally, it's 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 formatted to be a hex crawl. It's very exploration based, um, which again I was I gravitate towards. I have like injected a lot into my five E game by myself because it's not supported as much in the rule set. And this is based on that. Like we roll dice. It's winter. Camping is harder. You're not necessarily going to get a guaranteed long rest. You better have a bedroll. You better bring some firewood. You know. You better. Uh, there's like camaraderie checks. If you tell a if you tell a good campfire story. While you cook dinner, you have a better chance of succeeding at getting a long rest. <laughs> like there's all every little detail is thought about and like meaningful. Um, and I think I think transitioning into it, we got a little bogged down because it's a different mindset. I think I, I watched a few times, um, sort of like the completest gamer coming out, not necessarily from you, but 
um, the fighter at the table was like, all right, we're going to go through and we're going to collect every quest and then we're going to decide like what the best order to do all the quests are. Uh, um, yeah. So you're in one hex of a hundred hexes and there's yeah. like, there's a, I can give you a hundred quests if you want. Like every yeah. time you kick over a rock, something spills out and the overwhelm happened very quickly. Uh, so if I were yeah. to start over, I might start, I might control, I think you guys ended up with like five or six yeah, like plot five and plots. a half, I think you said, and that was yeah. pretty close. And I think um, so. We had different quests. Some seemed like they were the reward was so high compared to our mm. starting gold. So we started with like mm. eight gold, and then uh, I think the other two with nine. And uh, one of the quests is like, well, if you come back with this brass ring, we're gonna give you. T I'm gonna give you two thousand gold, and it's like mm. this sounds way above our level. But but I don't know, you know. So but the thing is, mm. uh, and I don't want you to give anything away in this. Uh, but but what you were saying, one of the things that I was comparing was like the the richness and the well thought out background of this uh, backstory to what I get when I do run an advent an adventure league model uh, module that we get from either the books or from like uh, DMG um, uh, dungeon DM guild uh, like we'll get a lot of stuff from that and they're like modules that go alongside the books so if you're running like uh, Tomb of Annihilation, let's say. Um, yeah. They have like other like side quests that people have written that like interface. So, um, so I, and for instance, I ran one of those and the backstory is so incomplete or mm -hmm. you just don't know all of it. You'd have to have run the entire campaign and read the entire book, you know, in order to do this. So like there's room for the DM, actually you have to, I think as a DM, fill in the blanks so mm. so that's what i end up doing so for me when i run adventure league it, somebody who runs who sits at my table and plays an adventure league model and then goes to a con or something where they run the same module gonna have a completely different experience because i look at it as a suggestion <laughs> and mm. and you know what i mean and then i run what i think would be exciting so like for instance there was one that was set in the tomb of annihilation setting which is on an island, a tropical island of Cholt. And when you did with weather effects, I am totally mm. stealing for the next one. But you know, it's an it's a it's it's emphasized how oppressive, you know, it's hot, it's oppressive. Mm -hmm. And they were gonna go battle this like um devil who had like uh crossed in like the abyssal plane had somehow crossed into this pit. So they were gonna go there. But on the way they meet this dragon whose lover has been like um or mate has been like kidnapped. So there's a side quest to do that. And I said, well, that's, that's what I want to hear. This is, um, this was for Val, oh, this is around Valentine's day. So that was the mm -hmm. love story. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, we're on Chult. How could there not be any dinosaurs here? So I did that. So I'm like, okay, you got devils, dinosaurs, and dragons. It's going to be D and D and D. And so mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I just, I threw it in there because I'm like, if I were playing this and I were on Chult and I found out later that, there was a possibility of dinosaurs and we didn't see any forget that so mm -hmm. these guys got to t tame a dinosaur and take it mm -hmm. along with them as a pack animal so that was fun yeah yeah i think a lot of a lot of adventure writing out there is about what happened and then has a big eye on like what the culmination is going to be right in weeks or months if we get there <laughs> Um, and I, un I understand how you get there, but I think it's a trap. I think it's a big mistake. And what Dolman would does so well. And what I, what I do for myself and my prep and what I try to, what I try to do when I'm creating things for the public is like, this is what's happening now. This is the part of the game that the, the players are going to interact with. Um, and they're going to choose what is coming next. Cause especially you're in like, you know, medieval fantasy world. Not everyone has a, a classical education, right? Maybe the nobles know what happened six generations ago, but mm. like the 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 tavern keeper sure doesn't. He do, he's not going to tell you the history of the world. No, his from world the is very small. Myth to the, yeah. yeah, exactly. He hasn't been six miles from this village since he was a child. <laughs> he can tell you what he can tell you what happened down the block. You know, he can tell you. You know, he's nosy about all his neighbors or whatever, but like he doesn't know the grand history of the 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 empire that fell six centuries ago. Maybe he knows some like like a song or a story about it, but he probably right. he might not even believe it, right? Right. That's uh, the thing. It's it's a lot of hearsay 
And I mm -hmm. think that's fun. You know, you can, you can mm. get misinformation and then, you know, you have to like sort out what's true. And, uh, but the way, like, but some of the things you did, which were interesting and I don't know, like I said, I don't know how much of this is you and how much of it's written, but it's, um, but like we had a, a possible quest where there were a bunch of guys who were basically, um, uh, feel like they're protecting the town. Uh, but they were, but then later we mm. talked to the authorities and they're like, yeah, we got this vigilante problem. So now you have to think, okay, well, th thank goodness we didn't get roped in that quest, or maybe we're now labeled as almost criminals. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, I can already see where this is going to have decisions are going to have lasting ramifications. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the good shit for me. And that puts, that puts the, the game master on the back foot a little bit, right? I don't have this grand plan of what's going on. I have, I have a thousand, so again, I have 99 other hexes. You could burn this place to the ground and I don't care. There's more to, there's plenty more to explore. But like I, that so that, that character was in there. The way I did not plan to try to rope you into his thing. It's not, it's kind of set up so you bounce off him pretty quickly. Because he's it's he's a repulsive person, yeah, <laughs> in yeah. several dimensions. Um, but the way you guys navigated the town, like you went here for dinner instead of going there to sleep first, and so what you heard about him was through the lens of somebody else who was like a little more sympathetic to what the guy was trying to do, and therefore, you know, it, again in the game remote, it's like oh. That, there's a person that has the exclamation part. We're going to go to him, and if it's worth it, we're going to get his quest and complete it and gain our internet points, or you know, sure. And so get when you XP, did walk yeah. up to that guy and expect him to be the vanilla quest giver, and it's just like, oh no, this is a real, this is a real complicated person. <laughs> well, that's uh, part of the yeah. That was something that I wanted to address too, and uh, I know I played a little meta last night. Uh, and I did say things like, I found a quest giver, you know, just kind of yeah. jokingly with the other two uh, players that I haven't played with before. So it's, you know, mm -hmm. so we're actually literally building camaraderie amongst ourselves, feeling out each other's sense of humor and, and which intellectual properties we like to quote and things mm -hmm. of that nature, which references, pop culture references we get and, you know, that sort of thing. But ultimately, I think uh, this is going to be a lot of fun to really role play and just stay in character right and and i think what's what i one of the things about character creation let's talk a little bit about the nuts mm. and bolts of it uh mm -hmm. because it is different than uh D D 5e at least a lot of the ways D D 5e is very forgiving uh so if you say like i want to play a bard you know they're like okay then put your highest uh stat in charisma and you know here's a standard array and you can do it that way or you can point by but the way we rolled it up was different so you want to tell them like how we rolled our yeah, characters we, we did we did 46 drop the lowest i was generous uh and pat if i remember correctly you benefited greatly from that that was <laughs> oh, ridiculous we did we did 46 shots. Yeah. You, I you, rolled you so up. crazily well. You this character's options. unbelievable. But we went old school down the line. So the dice are telling you, like, all right, you have an 18 in strength. strength. Right. Don't and put it anywhere you, you want. Something about this character. Yeah. You're not, you can, can't move it around. There's a little, there's a house rule, uh, not a house rule, but an optional rule where you can like subtract two to add one if you really had your heart set on that bard or whatever. Um, but the dice tell you what kind of character. And I kind of mitigated that by letting everybody, well, you you joined us a little bit later, but I let everybody like roll a couple characters, get a feel for that system. Um, because again, characters are cheap too. So now people have a stable. Um, I encourage my 5e players to do this as well, like have a backup in mind because mm -hmm. you might die, because I like a deadlier game and I really like putting the fear into people, even if no one I haven't killed a player character in a minute. But um I like the specter there. So having a backup character. It takes the thing out of it a little bit. In mm -hmm. old school D and D, have a backup character because you're going to need it because <laughs> mm -hmm. you got you, you have two hit points. Uh, you're the tank with like seven hit points. Oh, if you play Tomb of Horrors, like you know, forget it. You better have oh, like yeah. ten characters going into that because it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, like people are going to yeah. die. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. Not the point is of, like, the fun of finding stuff, the but... traps. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, like, it's you, you fail forward. Yeah. It's well. It's <laughs> it's it's like watching a. Um, a horror movie or something it's kind of like the the interesting ways that characters die you know that's mm -hmm. you know the, the stupid ways 
characters die kind of uh, thing, which is, you know, and that's a, that's a specific type of campaign setting. But you've emphasized that this is going to be a lethal. So, like, if you, like, you know, go out in the woods, you could get eaten by a bear. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Like, just like in real life. Like, hey, let's go to Yosemite. Let's go camping. It's going to be awesome. Brr. Okay, let's get back in the car really quick. You know, like, um, that sort of thing can happen. And I think that's I, that's going to make this a lot more interesting because uh, basically, you know, D and D has always been lampooned or has often been lampooned as being like you know your bunch of uh, murder hobos running around, you know, like from mm -hmm. town to town just killing things or mm -hmm. people or or at the best you're like the Witcher, you know, which is you take care of problems but you are you know but you you are a killer because nobody else wants to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but that's kind of not the way this is being played. I think that's one of the reasons I really liked the fact that you let me do the, um, or I decided to do the uh, knight character instead of the straight fighter character, because mm -hmm. now that brings into this, this whole like kind of mythos, you know, that's um, explained in the book. It was talking about a high chivalry and, you know, courtly, and I'm going to bring in courtly love and that kind of thing, because mm -hmm. you introduced my mistress in the sense that, um, not lover, but like the uh, lady Your of the house. Yeah, 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 like yeah, like this. This is like basically one step below God. You know, like you would do anything for her. Your ultimate duty is to serve her in some way, even through any action that you're doing. It should be, you know, reflect on in a good light on her, and mm -hmm. uh, and then to actually see her as a 21 year old, and you know that's interesting too. Like we were old for age. We mm -hmm. rolled for hairstyle. We rolled for uh, weight and, uh, you know, all our um, earthly possessions. There was no like, oh, I'm going to buy a grappling hook. Like, okay, you have a grappling hook. I mean, later you could go into town in the market, but I found out real quick, well, I don't have enough money to buy anything. So like I was going <laughs> to, I would, I still might sell my lance and get a sword because carrying around a 10 foot lance is kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> awkward and uh heavy and uh encumbrance is a thing which i never is a thing. i never do in 5e but like that's this is going to make things very interesting and it sounds i could see you know someone who doesn't have experience with like a more old school style coming from fifth edition hearing all this and being like man that sounds awful um <laughs> but one all of these limitations give you creativity right like if i walk in like i'm gonna make thor right i'm gonna i'm making a tempest cleric and it's thor whereas like i sit down it's like i don't know what's gonna happen i'm like Whoop, this character like appears in front of me that like arises organically that's that's the good stuff for me and now i can occupy that and you end up doing things that you wouldn't have otherwise um we didn't even make up our names you need, we rolled for everything and like yeah. the, you you don't have to go that route but it's it's there i love tables and every little detail like the trinkets are amazing every little detail is perfect incredible um and like the interplay of different uh like the friar had like jug ears and like yeah. scraggly hair or something it was just yeah. like perfect like again this like one see little it. like a sentence fragment perfectly like crystallizing a character um real talent there um, I think, and I think what, so the actor part of me loves this, you know, mm -hmm. like, this is like, you're given a, you're given a role. Mm -hmm. Now, an actor who's given a script, you know, can look at that script and they can sort of maneuver a little bit, but ultimately the character is the character, right? So I'm mm -hmm. playing a character, you know, but I'm informing that maybe with my own experience, but, you know, this this guy's, you know, got an 18 inch strength. He's a woodcutter. He's been his care, you know, his personality is enthusiastic, but naive or gullible, I should say. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's perfect for a 21 year old, you know, woodcutter that just became a, a squire. And, uh, you know, he maybe like wasn't born into nobility or maybe he came from a family that was down on its luck and now he's trying to re-establish the family name who knows we're you know that sort of that sort of thing you know is is makes it interesting to me the backgrounds i you know that's one of the things about 5e i always like too is the mm -hmm. that we don't focus on as much the backgrounds but the backgrounds can inform uh 
not only like skills, uh, but possessions, you know, proficiencies and that sort of thing. And I think it, this experience has given me an idea that I was just talking to my wife about at lunch um, for when I start the next uh, six week session of teaching the kids is that I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around the room and say like, okay, here's a bunch of backgrounds. Now, what's something a noble would say mm -hmm. given this situation? Okay. Given the same situation, what's something an urchin would say or mm -hmm. a sailor or a soldier What's the difference between a, what something a sailor would say and a soldier would say, right? They're both maybe military archetypes, not necessarily the sailor, but like, you know, how would it be different? I mean, when I talk to my Air Force buddies, they talk differently than my Navy buddies. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So what, you know, and to tell like, to have like middle schoolers try to think about this st stuff when they're forming their own personalities, their mm -hmm. own characters aren't formed yet. So now mm -hmm. it informs them on like, oh, maybe this, I mean, I hope so. And at best it informs them, maybe this is how I'm being perceived now when I use this type of language, when I construct my, but if I thoughtfully construct my language, then maybe I'm perceived as something else. And I've been trying to emphasize this because there's a, uh, you know, there's this whole thing uh, with, you know, kids, and you know, we were all kids that age. There's things that you say and do, there's slang, that sort of thing. But how that's perceived in certain situations may be to your benefit and not. So, mm. you know, letting kids be aware of that. And I think role playing helps anyone do this, right? It helps yeah, adults, switching. It helps adults uh -huh. do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, when you're sitting I in a. Try... Oh, go ahead. I try very hard to have the NPCs care about what you're saying. And again, what I like about this old school style is that, like, I don't think there was, a, I rolled dice, we rolled dice on, like, to make the characters and to, like, determine the weather and the dates. The weather, the oh my birthdays. god. But, like, there were no, I don't think I called for a single skill check in the two to three hours that we played. You know, it's just like. And there was no combat. There was no, there was no combat, but, like, your character says a thing, the NPC reacts to it based on who they are and how you said it, not the role of the dice, right? Skill versus every time I pick up a die, it's luck determining the outcome here. I was, or, yeah, I was wondering about that because when I went up to like, my character went up to these two noble women at the mm -hmm. bar that were kind of like, nah, we don't, this isn't great. We don't want to be here. And mm -hmm. um, I tried, I tried to kind of compliment them and maybe mm -hmm. charm them a little bit. And you didn't call for a, a skill check. That was cool. Um, I just, um, yeah. Cause that's a situation where, you know, and in 5e, if I were a DM, I would have definitely been like, okay, use, you know, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do persuasion? Do you want to do intimidation? Right. Do you want to do right. deception? How do you want to do this? And that's the, you know, that's the classic Matt Mercer, you know, how do you want to do that thing? But um, it was so smooth the way you did it. It mm. was like watching a movie, you know, it was like reading a novel. It was, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't like, and now I'll turn to page 34. You know, if you go down the stairs, you know, like the choose your own adventure kind of thing, this was yes. way smoother than that. Yes. It's not just, you're not just pushing the button on the character sheet that's going to get you the best outcome. <laughs> you are thinking about what you're, and there's a, you know, you don't have to, you, you have an, an actor's background, you inhabit the character, right? But like, I'm not, I don't require you to like create the cogent argument that's going to convince the NPC and and say it verbatim necessarily every time um but like flashback five six weeks ago my my buddy uh had all his ducks in a row approaches uh the banshee actually and lost mine of fan delver uh has a gift is very polite uh addresses her properly in the correct language so i give him advantage on a charisma tech uh i think we, we want persuasion uh he rolled a one and a two <laughs> Boom. So she she pops she pops the visage, I think. Everybody runs. Uh I didn't kill everybody, but like they were way outclassed and like he did everything perfectly. And the the dice said no. And okay, a banshee is fickle, right? Like I, I made it make sense in my mind and in the story and everything. Sure. But you know, driving home that night, I was like, ah, I shouldn't have had him pick up the dice. I should have just given it to him. Um and in fifth edition, that kind of cheats somebody who all right I, I i i took the time to do my homework literally i did the math i built a character who's good at charisma 
I'm not good at hitting people because I'm good at talking to people. So if you don't let me push that button, you're taking something away from me. Mm, that's Whereas... one way to look at it. I There was a guy, uh, yeah, the last two weeks ago, I ran a uh, tier three. And, uh, you know, good. these guys are good. These characters are good at everything they specialize in. And mm -hmm. he had advantage on a roll and he rolled two ones. And we I'd never seen that before. Never. So that one in 400 chance, eventually you're mm -hmm. going to see it. But that was mm -hmm. the first time I had ever seen it happen in front of my eyes. And uh, it was hilarious, you know. So it's the fails that I remember. That's why yes. playing min-max characters is so much fun because mm -hmm. I saw a lot of times, in fact, when you mentioned the drop to add one, I immediately mm -hmm. thought, oh, why didn't I do that? But there's a rider to that rule in Dolan, uh, Wood that is... Um, or I'm sorry, Dolman Wood. I keep saying Dol, that wrong. Dol, Dolman. So Dol, the Dolmans are the the standing stones that dot the the forest. Um, gotcha. Um, so they're like Saracens or something like that. The standing stones. Dolman Wood is um, that uh, you can do that, but only if you're under a twelve, right? To make something there's a, a cap, thirteen, I, it's twelve or thirteen. You can't. I you think can't it's to make the, it a thirteen because thirteen is where you get plus by... one writer yeah there's a point by writer where you can't so if you have your heart set like i want a bard i'm gonna burn I'll, i will burn every other ability score to get my uh charisma whatever charisma over the the bare minimum to be a bar because there's requirements not everyone can be a knight if you can't live if you can't pick up a lance they're not going to train you to be a knight you know probably not um if you can't if you're illiterate they're not going to let you study at the scholar academy of well, you know arc be arcane uh -huh. um yeah. And I think it's it's interesting. This is the first, and again, this is an old school thing. This is this is BX, but there's a there's a bonus to um, XP accrual if you're good at what you're good at. If you are if you are a if you are a fighter and you have a good a high strength score, you might get an extra five percent XP. So you're leveling faster. So if you're better at what you're doing, it it it's a feedback loop. Uh, oh, that was a uh, dungeon siege. Like. The video game dungeon siege was like that. So, like oh, when you, when you would play at the beginning, you would have all three skills. Like you would, you know, have your ranged attack, your magic, and your um, your uh, uh, melee attack. But then once you started doing one thing more than the others, you would advance quicker, and mm -hmm. so you basically just stuck with that. So, so you know, you just played an archer or you played like a melee dude or you were a magic user but and so but it makes sense in a in a real world way right mm -hmm. so like i mm -hmm. just studied um quarter staff so if i go back and i study small sword then uh it's going to be a lot easier because i already know what a bind is i already know what a uh you know um you know, I know some of the moves. Let's put it that way. I don't want to get into any technical stuff. But, but, but if I've never done that before, then I got to start from scratch, right? Right. Whereas, right. you know, I mean, so if I, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's there's, you know, like people that are good at racket sports. Like it just makes sense. Like somebody that's good at tennis is going to be good at pickleball. They're going to be good at ping pong. They're going to be good at, you know, that just makes sense because they know how they know tricks that non-players don't know. You know. And you're gonna advance faster. You're gonna you're gonna pick up the sport faster, and you're going to continue to to improve faster. Um, okay, eventually you plateau, which I guess is true in the the character arc too. Oh, but yeah, I really well. Again, it takes more and more XP as levels up. Um, oh, I see. We're also see. there's also varying XP, so people are going to be leveling up at different levels, which sounds like a nightmare if you're running fifth edition. But it's like mm -hmm. fine as long as everyone's within four levels of each other, you're cool. Yeah, well, um, that's that's funny because that's come up, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's not. It, it's people are like, oh, well, it's fine. It, tier one is tier one. The difference between a level one character and level four character is day and night yes. a difference between five and ten is day and night a difference between 11 and 16 is ridiculous in fact um i mean they're all good don't get me wrong they're they're all good but i threw a uh mage an abjurer at um the party to soften them up uh she had a meteor storm uh scroll uh just one just so she could fire it away and i did it as a uh color thing because uh it was near easter it was the week before easter so i had jelly beans run down, rain down from the sky and i actually had physical jelly beans come down on the nice. you know, little make little, it rain yeah little things <laughs> exactly so uh the uh 
And then when they got treasure, I had chocolate coins. So I threw a bag of chocolate coins at him. But the, but the uh, 16th level wizard said, oh, I don't think so. And then mm-hmm. rolls counter spell, rolls like mm-hmm. a 19. And mm-hmm. then, well, all those jelly beans just went whoosh, back up in the sky. So like, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? You know, it's just, that's the thing with 5e. It's, it's uh, keeping the party. And that's why... Um, when I do anything that's not just a one shot, if it's going to be a level up kind of situation uh, and we're going to do multiple se- sessions, I just do everybody levels up at the same time because otherwise mm-hmm. it gets too unbalanced. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Miles, milestone is the way to do it in fifth edition. That's um, what I do. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is not, I'm not like dashing 5e. No, no, no. We're, we are just... actually comparing the differences between yeah. my first impression, our first impressions and and 5e and 5e is our touchstone right that's the one mm-hmm. we know so i just i mean one it, i i like variety right and I'm playing the same game for years and years now it was, it was time to change up even before whatever the drama of 2023 um but beyond that i find in fifth edition i i love the first few levels because the immersion is easier for me as you level up you're very quickly a marvel superhero and the the removal the, the, the space between the player and the character becomes very great, right? And it's cool right. to, like, imagine yourself doing these amazing things and you're, you're calling down a meteor swarm from the back of a griffin or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, okay, eventually you can get there in the old school way, too. But, like, when you are just, like, some schlub walking out trying to earn some coin to improve his gear so he can <laughs> survive easier walking through the forest, like, that's that's easier for me to to project myself into right if you if you get hit with an arrow you're in trouble (laughs) right somebody shot you with an arrow or you're you're face to face with a bear it's not like oh this is going i hope this is fun and not boring because it takes too long um it's like no this is this is dangerous if a bear bites you in the neck you you might be in trouble that could that could be it for you um well i mean about it before charging in that's what Mike, I mean, that's what um, our friend uh, Bertrand did was uh, he was a fighter character. And uh, the first thing he did was look for work. And uh, that was a smart move. You know, um, I, that's probably what a character would do. Like they want to mm-hmm. eat that night. They got to make some coin. And uh, they, you know, it's freezing outside. I rolled a double zero for the weather. <laughs> so it was like, you know five below zero during the day and it was going to be colder at night. So like, you know, and then the next day was no, not much better. It was all windy. So, you know, this is, these effects, I like the fact that there are environmental fact, factors that are going to affect the environment. I mean, affect the uh, gameplay. And uh, yeah, this is, these are all great things to inform me on how to do my next 5e session too. So mm-hmm. that's, what's really neat is that, the more I learn about other systems, like mm-hmm. uh, for instance, um, there's a Star Wars role playing game. There's three. I can't remember which one was the one that I actually played. I think it was Edge of Empires, Edge of the Empire, something like that. And it has specific kinds of dice, mm-hmm. and they're mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about. So I so you can them. succeed at something, but you can also have a a, a, a consequence. So for mm-hmm. instance, like you hack into uh, the security system in order to gain access to the data files. However, it trips off an alarm. So mm-hmm. you succeed at what you wanted to do, but now there's like a squad of stormtroopers that may be heading your way. And and I have I learned that, uh, you know, whenever I first played that, I don't know how many years ago, and I've I've always remembered that. So I can, I will do that sometimes where if somebody makes a roll and they barely pass, I know that's not the way the rules set, stated in 5e, you either win or lose, but that's mm-hmm. the way one of my interpretations is like, you know, I'll, I'll say, okay, yeah, you were able to pick the lock, but in doing so, you broke your, you broke your lock pick tools and you made a lot of noise. So the people in the room are going to know you're coming in, you know, that kind of thing. And that, yeah, I do that a lot of like de- degrees of success, right? The difference between what's the difference? Okay, it's a pass fail, cool. Um, but if there's degrees of success, the difference between a 17 and a natural 20 will be significant. And that's kind of, I think that's kind of how I started down that path of like, okay, crit, you get a little something extra on sure. top. Um, 
but also at the same time when like you're you're setting a dc and you're like honestly some of the time not a yeah i was almost at a lot of the time some of the time i don't have the dc in mind when i call for the check mm. when it's some improvised thing it's not in the book it's not something i prepped roll the dice if it's a 19 i'll think about it. i don't have to think about it if it's a three i don't have to think about it and you get those like 12 13 Blurry, blurries yeah. and you're like okay that's not decisive so now you know what what i do half the time is go back and like okay can figure out what the dc would have been but success at a cost is such a great answer for those moments of like okay you do it but um and you just you just have more more notes to play right more more colors to paint with when you're doing it that way yeah um, and i think like I, the door's the open yeah and if the player character like informs me of something and tells me like how they're going to do it. So they're going to, they're going to get to that window that the rogue is going <clears> to, <throat> you know, wants to roll <clears throat> in order to get into that window, the second story window. Like, that's great. But how are you going to do that? You know? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there's vines on the side of the, okay, great. How much do you weigh? Uh, there's vines, you know, like stuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a trellis? Is there, you know, is there a ladder in the garden? Is there a, a tree nearby? You know, that kind of thing. So, and that's the other thing that's nice about like the three word description of an environment is that unless you specifically put something in the uh, environment, now you can add things or you mm -hmm. can, you know, because once you put it in, you can't take it away. You tell mm -hmm. them that there's a there's a uh, tree branch that reaches over to the to the you know within like three feet of the window. Why don't you just open the window for them? I mean, like you know, it's like you're, you're leading them, and that's great. You can do that because if you really want, you need a plot device. You need something to happen, but you want the care the players to think that they made a decision to make that happen. That's a writer's trick, right? That's like a mm -hmm. that's a that's a trick. But it's a good trick, and it's and because we want immersion, you know, as players, we want to feel like we affected the story, and so, you know, if if as a DM, sometimes you got to like, you're not you don't want to railroad the characters necessarily, but you you want them to go in that room, like go in the door, you know, stop looking at the door and go in the door, you know, it's a door, <laughs> you know, like it's the <laughs> classic, like you know. If you tell a D and D player it's a door, they stand there for twenty minutes and argue about who's going to touch the door. You know, a lot. I think a lot of dungeon masters' first like hard earned lesson um, is putting a like. There's a there's the door is barred. It's a strength check to open it up. Everybody fails, and the adventure can't advance. <laughs> and yeah, you just like you literally have gatekeeped the story. Gate kept the story, um, <laughs> gate keepered the story, and um, yeah, and and then you how do you how do you proceed? And that's another that's another reason I like the old school approach of like the answer's not on the character sheet; it's it's the player that's getting tested, not the character. So that's one way to oh, play. So that's that's a, a very I interesting a crowbar, way to play. Boom. Okay, cool. It's open. No, no, no check required. The dice can't burn you on this. That's the uh, thing with puzzles that are always tough for me is that whenever I put a puzzle in there, it's like, does the character know how to do a Sudoku or does the player know how to do a Sudoku? You know, like right. it's, it's, right. um, if you've heard the Sphinx Riddle, you know, then like that doesn't work, you know, like you, you I mean, it, or maybe it does for a second, but like, I I still have not found the balance with a good puzzle that is just takes just the right length of time, so it's not boring, but it's not like you know checking a box. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why puzzles. I I I love the idea of putting puzzles in my adventures, but I have rarely seen it done well. You know. Yeah, you have to know your you have to know your audience, and I think you need to have that consensus. You either build it the first time the puzzle comes out, or you have it out of the gate. But like, I I don't like, uh, especially on the player side, but but also on the game master side, when I'm like, okay, here here is the puzzle, and someone's like, oh, what do I roll for that? And it's like, well, hold hold on, mm -hmm. you know, like do we we you can solve the puzzle, and there is there is that divide again between the player and the character, and my goal is to do as much as possible to, to to 
crunch that down so mm. people are inhabiting the role of the character um and again that doesn't necessarily mean acting and doing the voice and everything but like having the experience see, seeing through their eyes and interacting with the world as if it were real and as they were in it um so yeah you are i would prefer if you are trying to solve the puzzle opposed to you're looking at your character sheet like oh well i have a, I have a plus three in intelligence and if he gives me guidance and she helps me then maybe we can pass this and or maybe get a clue I mean, that's one way to do clue. it. What you actually do it meta in the sense that the the character rolls well, but then you give the player a clue, so they mm -hmm. still have to use their brain to solve it. And then if it gets too much, then you just let the the character do it. But it's you know, but I see what you're saying about like the character in the sense that like you know there may be a couple here's here's one way i would do it so there's a couple ways to solve the puzzle right so you can sit there mm. and play chess against death or you can just like clobber him with the sword you know like or you know i'm playing chess with death and then the barbarian comes over and knocks his rattles his bones with a great axe you know so mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know I, I i will allow for creative solutions you know but um yeah, it's. I think that's one part of five E, or well, that's one part of just generally role playing games that I find can be troublesome. The other thing that is an interesting comparison between um, Dolman Wood and five E, I think D and D five E is that um, exploration in D and D five E. I've seen more than one YouTuber, uh, D and D YouTuber, talk about how there isn't. You know, there's no rule set in 5e. There's like two paragraphs mm -hmm. in the books that, you know, the core text that says, you know, well, the uh, um, the player characters explore the environment. They ask the DM, the DM describes it, and then they go on. And that's it. So it's, there's, you know, so what I like about Dolmenwood is it looks like there's going to be a lot of exploration and mm -hmm. that, or the potential for explanation, exploration. I think... That's going to be that's going to inform me as a DM on how to incorporate some of those entertaining aspects because my memories of early D and D were a lot of exploration. There was mm -hmm. there was a lot of discovery, and there was the pencil on the graph paper, like I'll draw the next corner, you know, and you know here's the tentacle wall behind the secret door, and you know that kind of stuff. And we used to sit around in high school and write these things, you know, draw these things instead of doing math. And, uh, you know, uh, all the time and effort you put into drawing a map, whereas now 5e, it's like, you know, plop. Okay, here's a here's a square room. You know, there's a chest in the corner. Is it a mimic? Mm -hmm. Is it not? You know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, you know, that's part of the, th the, the part of it's what I do, which is Adventure League, which you're basically two, two and a half hours. You're doing a module. You're, you may be, there may be people, people at the table, you know, there probably aren't. And there may be people that are playing for the very first time. So you have to, you know, there's a lot of variables and you have to try to make everything uh, uh, palatable to everyone. So you make a weak sauce, but like, you know, when you have like what we're doing, which is like a recurring adventure every Tuesday with the same Mm -hmm. the same people then you're going to get to know oh well you know you know bertrand likes uh history and he so he'll know this you know and mike really uh understands arcana and he's the magic user so this is flavorful for him you know so that's so that's going to make it more interesting as a dm i think you know being able to customize the environment a little bit yeah and because it's so rich and chock full already it's like what and i think that was the mistake i was like what do you want to do all of these things like you know you, you a knight a wizard and a fighter walk into a bar who do you talk to which thing do you follow and there's oh i gotta know what are all of my options um and i and i think i should have cut that off earlier basically the clock stopped that from happening because you guys would have continued to explore prigward and pick up uh you know uh plot hooks not even coupons yet and there's there's a million there's a literally a, there's six ways to leave this hex right uh and there's three rows out of town and you talk to somebody they're going to tell you something else like there's a lot there's a lot left on the table still 
and I saw I saw Mike's eyes because so they're player roles too. So Mike was yes. responsible for keeping track of everything. <laughs> he was responsible for taking notes, and I think that job is going to be divvied up. I think he's going to do the calendar and the weather. Like where were we on this day? What's the weather doing? So when we pick it up, we know what the weather was, and there's holidays and chances for things to happen on certain days or whatever. Birthdays. So I think he's going to be like the timekeeper. Yeah, um, but he was overwhelmed by like, okay, there's there's. It's a lot to write down. proper nouns on this piece of paper that I've never, I don't even know how to spell because they're all made up uh, gibberish. And how do I, how do I parse all of this information? Because it's my responsibility for everyone at the table now. Well, yeah, so I, I was, I wasn't was even a much. chronicler and I wrote um, yeah, five pages of notes. And so, um, you know, yesterday and I'm, I, that wasn't my responsibility. I, I guess I'm supposed to be the inventory guy, but the, but yeah, we probably will di divide it up. And I think, yeah, Mike, maybe the, you know, the, the, the journal entry and then, uh, um, maybe Bertrand seems to be good at like s parsing out the quests. So maybe he's the guy that keeps track of the, th the, the leads, you know, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't know what my role will be in addition to like being the quartermaster, just keeping track of who has what, you know, who has the 50 lengths of 50 foot length of rope, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm sure eventually that will become uh, essential, especially as we get more characters and maybe pack animals and things of that nature or a wagon or something crazy. So, um, yeah, it, it that's but that's part of it too, right? So like that's what we used to do back in the day. You know, we used to make our maps and uh and and we'd have a week or so or more to think about what we were going to do next. And that's what's really cool about session 1 is we got five or six things that we can ponder, but we but it was smart of you to say before the session ended, "Hey, why don't you guys pick three things?" <laughs> Yeah, well, so I, you're not yeah. having to do all this homework, you know, because it's impossible. It's impossible for me to prep. It's a sandbox. It's just a giant, beautiful, packed to the gills sandbox. So it's impossible for me to prep. I can prep five things poorly, <laughs> right? Maybe, or I can prep the one or two things well. Right. Um, and you, you know, again, I want you to have ultimate freedom. You can walk off in any direction. You just have to tell me which direction you're going to walk off in. No. And that also keeps it moving because, again, I think a little bit of like analysis paralysis set in where it's like, how do we decide between these five things? And there's plenty of opportunity to add more to that list before you start removing things from that list. Um, so geography yeah, was seemed like being the decisive. First, yeah. Yeah. It seemed like yeah. a geographical thing. Well, I mean, that just seemed like the I, I wanted something easy so we didn't get killed on our first quest and something that was close. So it seemed like the vigilantes were um, reasonable. They're they were you know like you know a couple you know one one leader and a and a, some youngins that maybe mm -hmm. or maybe not can be intimidated. We'll we'll see what happens. It'll be I think that'll be fun. I think it'll be fun. But again, there will be consequences because the mm -hmm. owner of the tavern where we stayed the night is their grand uncle. So you know if you just like roughhouse these guys and throw them in jail now you got somebody who's like hey you threw my relatives in jail like that you don't have to do that like why'd you do mm -hmm. that and, and yeah he might not be like politically correct but he's he he wants to protect the town so like he's got a mixed motive there and i like the shades of gray I, I really like that uh that's one of the reasons i like i've been playing fallout new vegas since it came out 2010 because you can change the environment like you're mm -hmm. you're you mm -hmm. actually have ramifications like uh mass effect 3 uh, or mass effect i mean um uh there are other the good what i think are the good rpgs have that quality about them so you can re replay and say oh well what if skyrim what if we were what if you were an imperial instead of uh mm -hmm. you know Skyrim actually gets a little linear towards it, but like, you know what I'm saying. And that's what D&D can do better than any other game. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I try to extract from my D&D experience because in a video game, it, there's a lot of things you can do better in a video game, right? I can get very descriptive with words, but I can't, I, I'm not going to paint a picture with my words the same way a video game can, especially these days. Um, but 
the best video games, maybe there's a couple different endings, right? Maybe there's a couple different tracks. Maybe there's a couple different factions you can join. You know, it's like a couple different video games stapled together, really, at the end of the day. Um, there's no limit. Like, I, I have no, there is, there is no limit here. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, five main factions, six main factions. Um, you guys are already affiliated with two of them, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and there's the interrelationship between all of them and you can become your own thing, but like every decision you start to make is going to have ramifications and change how you're viewed by certain people and certain, you know, power structures and all of that's going to have consequences on the, the world of the game. Um, so I have, I have no idea what happens uh, next, really. Uh, I have ideas, obviously I, I can't, I think about it, but there's, there's an, infinite amount of possibilities in a way that gets me very excited because there's nothing there's not much else like that um however good the game is there's only so someone had to decide where you were going first so it yeah. renders in front of you but you nailed it you just said D D. that's what D D is best at and i think you know that's what you do when you play a game you play with strengths and and that's that's what we're doing here there, there's such a rich lore and uh you know, and, and, and uh, you know, what you said about video games is interesting. I mean, yeah, you're right. There's graphics, lots of interesting colors, even like, you know, Final Fantasy is almost photorealistic. But like, um, you know, if you could have like, you know, an anime character look almost like a photograph. But it doesn't matter eventually, like, but there's nothing beats your imagination. There's a, a guy mm -hmm. that I played, and we, we joke about this a little bit, but... My one friend, uh, he was like, I like when you DM because I can see it mm. like like it's a movie in my mind, you know? And I'm like, that's you, dude. That's your imagination. Yes. I, I'm, I may be tickling that in the right way, but like that's all you because I only said three words, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I said like, you know, musty, you know, dilapidated and, you know, you know, ancient, and you went wherever you went with that, dude. I, you know, that's you. Uh, I, I'm not responsible <laughs> for your imagination, but that's what makes it so wonderful, and that's what the best writing does too. Is it allows yes us to inform yes. it ourselves. And maybe it's because I come from like a very literary background that I enjoy it so much, but like that is what I try to cultivate to the point where I, you know, in my other game I run online and like I run Albert Rodeo because it's simple. Like I run a pretty as like lo-fi analog game because the more that I do, the less that you're doing, the more that you become a passive observer and you're not engaging your imagination and there's so so much of everything we perceive comes through a screen at us and we just sit there even if we're even if we're controlling it you're you're not creating the same way when you're playing a video game as you do in a ttrpg when when you're doing it right um and that's what really attracted me to to this old school mindset of again not even like put the character sheet down flip it over like it's about what would you do in this situation because that's what's going to determine the outcome here. Yeah. Um, it's not just like, oh, this is a fun exercise. What would you do in this situation? Okay, let's see if it worked based on what the numbers say. Um, and that yeah, comes, that... it comes down to that at a certain point. Yes, but like put, putting less of an emphasis on that and more of an emphasis on your character interacting with the world as if it were real. Having my, a greater my, effect. My idea of the dice was was that that's that's when there is an element of luck yes right yes. so that's just the random element of chance and and that's i mean literally and you can affect that with your with your scores to a mm -hmm. certain degree mm -hmm. but but ultimately if somebody says i want to jump on the dragon i'm going to let him try to jump on the dragon you know like yes. i'm not you know i'm going to also maybe re-emphasize this is a really dangerous thing to do this mm -hmm. thing can kill you with a look well with a breath and uh but okay you know and invariably mm -hmm. you know when i run uh uh what is it um the first module uh rise of the dragon or, or mm -hmm. horde of the dragon queen um 
you know, there's always some level one character who just wants to jump on the dragon, usually a, a kid, but like, hey, you know what? You're not going to ever be able to do that in real life. Yes, I'm going to let you do that. Sure. Yes. You may die, but I'm going to let mm -hmm. you jump on it. So, uh, you know, and invariably they roll like a 20. It's crazy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I love it. But uh, yeah, but it's, it, it, you know, I think you're right. It's, D&D &D has some real advantages and uh, it, it can vary based on the way the DM runs the game. Uh, but yeah, we've all, hit, we've had some really good points here, I think. But Dolman Wood looks fun, interesting, rich, deep, and uh, it can be game. It, it's even been compared to, you know, they said Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones kind of thing. Uh, so yes. there's politics, there's mm -hmm. factions, there's, uh, which is one of the things about Game of Thrones that's so much fun. Uh, you know, and then those shifting, those alliances, I don't know, but they, you know, the way Game of Thrones did it, they can shift. So, and that's the way politics works. So, that's incredible. I've I've yeah. been holding back of like gushing about the lore because I don't want to. You yeah, you want to ruin anything. <laughs> but like, but, but for oh, those of us, joy to read. Yeah, but it's, for it's our, so good. It is so good. Yeah, for our audience though, you know, we can you can tell you can inform you're gonna tell them like, is this something as a DM that you want to pick up? I can already see it would be useful for any DM to like take yeah, so a good, these materials. A good like uh, little crystal like litmus test of it. We were talking about puzzles before and like, okay, if the player rolls well, they'll get like a clue or something. There is, and technically it's optional, but there is uh, a pipe weed in this game, pulling on the Lord of the Rings reference. And one, there's a D20 table, right? There's like 20 types and they all have different flavors and scents and like uh, effects, which you can you can make more mechanical, but or can sit just in the realm of flavor. Um, but there's an optional rule: if you sit down and smoke a pipe for a turn for ten minutes and contemplate, if you, you can roll an intelligence check and derive a clue that way. If you sit down with your party members, for every person who's participating in this little smoke sesh to like contemplate the problem, your odds of improving that result increase, so that you can like figure something out by sitting there having a smoke and thinking about it um and again there's just a, a, a beautiful there's a little d20 table with just like just the right amount of detail to make each one of these things evocative and flavorful um and every every aspect of the game is like that you go foraging there's 20 kinds of plants there's 20 kinds of mushrooms and that's what's in the player's handbook certain regions you can find rare things in the that are in the dungeon master's guide um it's just it is a beautiful well thought out world so much detail and each detail is gameable we'll have like we'll have an interaction with the character on theme fits the tone uh, it's, it, there's no there's not a wasted word in a 600 page uh, exploration based book like oh, it's amazing great. so good amazing. check it out yeah, um, this, I mean, I got to give it to this author. He's just something, this is special. Yeah, I mean, there's... And the artwork there, gonna, is good. Oh, there's some beautiful, it's like paintings. They are, uh, yeah, I the artwork is beautiful. Um, Again, perfect, like fairy tale, but like Grimm's fairy tale. Beautiful and alluring, but scary. <laughs> right, so like, right. So there's this one that uh, uh I can't, I, I would give the credit to the YouTuber if I could remember, but I was asleep and waking up and drifting off uh the um yeah there's like a couple of um young people like kind of prancing through a meadow like they're having a fun like holiday afternoon sort of thing in the upper part of the painting and then in the lower part of the painting in the bushes there's a skeleton you know like mm -hmm. it's black and white and green and you know up here it's blue and you know and grassy and lighter greens and it's just you know and and he's the the youtuber said this is a really great analogy for the whole thing it's just mm -hmm. you know you've got this wonderful like you know here's gnomes and here's like you know fa you know fairies and here's like humans interacting with them but then there's this dark undertone you know so and you could you could lean into one or the other, right? Like I'm just I sound like a hard ass this whole conversation, and you're running for, you know, eleven year olds. So <laughs> know your audience. You could lean into the more Disneyfied aspects of it. If you have a little experience under your belt, you could run. It's a setting, 
more than it is. It's a, it's a system. It's old school essentials modified a little bit, um, but it's a, it's a setting guide. So you want to run this in 5e. It would take a little bit of work, but you could do it. You want to run it in um, a different OSR system. It would take less work, but uh, easily doable. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a setting guide more than anything. That's what, that's what got me to buy in. Gotcha. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, do some due diligence and tell people how to buy it. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. So far session one, I, I'm going to say like a eight out of 10, you know, like I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Nice. Glad you're here. Glad what, you're here. Are you um, what are you thinking as far as running it? What do you think about difficulty or that kind of stuff? You want to give some people um, it's idea? easy to run. Um, I, <laughs> I got a tablet. So we should say it's not actually done yet. Dolmenwood is still a work in progress. Um, you can, you can, uh, support it on backer kit. If you're watching it right now, it should be, it should be dropping soon. It's mostly complete. Um, the PDFs, there's a couple like examples that he hasn't written out yet. And there's some like artwork here, um, spaces, but you get, the, if you back it, you get the PDFs, which is what I'm working on. So I got myself a little cheap tablet to be my D and D tablet. So uh, allow me to immerse you in this fantasy land where anything is possible. Oh shit! I closed the tab. How do I? What do I? So that 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 broke immersion a little bit, I think. Um, and again, I think maybe easing in fifth edition players to a, a more exploration style of play. I could have done a little better of a job with, but I'm always my you know toughest toughest critic. It was a blast. Oh. There were big big moments in the first session um it was yeah a lot of a lot of cool stuff on the table without already. a doubt we are always like our own worst critics all right so we mm -hmm. always you know go like oh what what so what i've started to do and i hope i don't know if this will help anybody out there or not but what i've done as a adventure league dm is that i'll run the module twice so I'll run it for Adventure League. Like I ran this tier three for Adventure League and then my evil spell jammer campaign, the DM couldn't make it. He got sick at the last minute. And so I just said on the discord, Hey, we can still show up at Phil's and we can, and we can play. I'll just, if you guys want to do a one shot, I'll just run this and I'll customize the levels to level five characters. And, um, they were all up for it, so I did. So now I ran the same module twice inside of two weeks, mm -hmm. actually like a little less than a week. So now it's here. Mm -hmm. But now I got it in my back pocket, literally. I If I walk into Adventure League tomorrow, or tomorrow night and uh, somebody doesn't show up, I can be like, well, I can do this, you know? I'll just modify, you know what I mean? Like on the fly. And I think the second session's always better because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I saw what the players bid on the first time. And mm -hmm. I also saw what they liked. And now I'm like, ah, oh, more of this. So more pepperoni. Okay, these guys like pepperoni and not sausage. So like, okay, I can do that. So this next time I gave them a big baddie that, you know, because the, the first one was like two heavy combats. And then during the second session, these guys just did this amazingly like six round combat. I couldn't believe it, but they mm. were all, none of them got into melee. They were all sniping from the sides, illusions, all really creative stuff, which mm -hmm. I loved. But then I thought we just did an hour and a half combat with three characters. I can't do another one. So I had like a freaking time dragon and a, beholder sitting in the library where they needed to get the book reading the book that they needed to get so they're not going to fight these guys like they're mm -hmm. not that dumb and so they're mm -hmm. like you know so it turned into this big social encounter so you know that didn't happen the first time so you know it it live and learn but but from the player's point of view i didn't see i didn't see anything wrong with pacing or any of it so good. yeah yeah so it was good all but, right well yeah, i'm excited for you guys to discover what's out there <laughs> you didn't even leave town yet <laughs> no we haven't well we barely left this the town walls just to like go to a tavern that was you know kind of hovering in the shadow mm. well i know you have a deadline so um you want to you want to wrap it up 
yeah, we're good. Everybody, uh, thank you for watching. Check out Dolman Wood. Uh, it is it is big and it is beautiful. Uh, stretch stretch your wings, expand your horizons. If you have only played Fifth Edition, there's a lot of other stuff out there, and you can learn from it and bring it back to Five E. Um, that's what that's what we're doing. <laughs> yep, that's it. All right, always great to talk to you. Enjoy, absolutely. Thanks, Pat. I appreciate you, man. All right, see you on the next one. Have a good one.